you know, when it comes to aquaculture, raising fish, producing fish, is actually not that difficult. Uh, it's it's the difficulty comes is when I have a fish that's remarkable size. What do I do with it? That's always been a issue with our fish farmers is how I go about selling this. And today's uh, Zoom, we're going to talk about a one segment of how we can go about marketing our fish, which is the farmer's market, which is probably one of the better ways for us to do the fish. We got a great program here. We got Jonathan Van Center who's going to talk about uh, how COVA uh, is affected uh, uh, aquaculture in the state. We got Teresa who's going to tell you how about pre selling your product. And then we got uh, Abigail. Uh, Vellabon is going to talk about the uh, farmer's market. Before I turn it over to Jonathan and let him get started, COVID has really impacted some of our farmers. I have a koi producer I've worked with for like 15 years, and he's done pretty well in the last 10 years selling his koi. This year, it has been dismal. In fact, he has now put up his farm for sale. So if you know somebody who wants to buy a nice piece of property down in Mecklenburg, if I had $800,000 lying around in my checkbook, I already would have purchased the place. Uh, you got 20 ponds, greenhouses, a nice middle building with a upstairs apartment, a fantastic place uh, down there near uh, Lake Chesna and uh, Bug Allen. And it's a good, good little place down at Bug Island. So anyway, unfortunately, uh, Kova has impacted him. When I talked to him last, he only had one sale, and he usually has eight or nine. He's usually finished by now. So, Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to uh, talk about the impact. Program's yours. All right, great. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, for uh, participating today. Um, as David mentioned in the introduction, I'm going to cover briefly the uh, impact of COVID-19 on U.S. aquaculture and aquaponics. The results that I'll be sharing with you today are from quarter one of an ongoing study. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of background and justification on why we started this, and then I'll get straight into the results. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge, of course, my co-authors on this, uh, Matthew Smith at The Ohio State University and Carol Engel with Englestone Aquatics. Um, so on January 20th, I think, you know, just a little bit of history. Um, the first confirmed case of COVID-19 was, was the first case of COVID-19 was confirmed in the United States. Uh, on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. And on March 13th, the United States declared a national emergency in response to COVID-19. Uh, this meant the closure of non-essential businesses and social distancing measures being implemented. And agriculture, including aquaculture and aquaponics, were clarified by the Department of Homeland Security as essential services, essential industries, so they were allowed to continue to operate. However, uh, they were not immune from the effects of the shutdowns that affected other segments of the economy. And that's what we'll talk about a little bit. So really what, what prompted this, this survey, this study to take place was some extension communications with producers. So uh, I do have an extension appointment. Matthew Smith is the director of extension at the Ohio State. And so in talking with producers, we've been hearing reports of lost sales, canceled contracts, um, reports of production challenges related to the shutdowns. And so at that point, uh, Matthew Smith actually proposed that we look at an assessment of the impacts of COVID-19 on the aquaculture industry. So we formed a collaborative uh, team between Virginia Tech, the Ohio State, and Englestone Aquatics. And of course, with very strong support from industry associations and individual producers, um, who of course we thank them for their support. Without their help, we wouldn't have been able to do this. Um, and so that's, that's what prompted this, uh, this study that's now underway. I should say the study, when it was launched, was not funded. It has since been 
funded with some support from National Sea Grant and NIMS, uh, who have been using the data that we've been generating and some of their decision making. So the data collection happened through a survey, an online survey through Qualtrics. Of course, because of COVID, we can't do any in-person survey activities. So we had to transition completely to working remotely. And so Qualtrics allowed us to do that. Uh, there was no specified sampling protocol, obviously because of the, uh, the time constraint here and trying to get something out the door as quickly as possible. We distributed the survey as widely as possible as we could and respondents then self-selected for participation. Now that's important because it means that there may be some bias in our respondents. Uh, we may have gotten respondents that were more affected by COVID-19 that felt more compelled to respond to such a survey than those that were less affected. So I just wanna clarify that up front. Although I think given some of the impacts that we did observe from the data, that it's quite likely that even those that didn't respond are experiencing similar challenges. So I did mention the study is quarterly. That means we are sending out a survey every quarter and the survey does change slightly. Uh, we do incorporate new information. For example, quarter two survey that just closed and we're working up the first set of results now um, did ask about some of the measures that the government implemented. Uh, in response to COVID-19, so some of the small business loans and things of that nature. But for quarter one, we had 652 total participants. Of that, 537 responses uh, were sufficiently complete for uh, allowing further analysis. So that's what we were able to use for the results that you're about to see. Uh, that 537 represents approximately 18% of the U.S. aquaculture industry based on the 2018 Census of Aquaculture. Uh, that reported a total of 2,932 farms in the country. So we got about an 18%, um, I wouldn't call it a response rate, but that's as close of a response rate as we can calculate. So I wanna cover first just kind of some characteristics, who were our respondents, uh, just to give you some background. You can see here from this chart that uh, primarily the, the, the mollusk industry is well represented. 41% uh, of our 537 were, were mollusk producers, um, then followed by food fish, uh, and then other. Other was an interesting group. We had some reptiles, we had uh, some other uh, types of fish, some marine fin fish that were represented there. Uh, then ornamentals, aquaponics, sport fish, allied businesses, crustaceans, and the rest were 1% uh, or, or fewer uh, in response. So in terms of scales of production, because scale does matter, we had a few folks, 12%, that did not uh, want to disclose their scale. Um, but you can see here that 22% of the respondents were, were quite large scale, over a million dollars in annual sales, uh, followed by a tie between the 100,000 to 250,000, the 250,000 to 500,000 categories. Um, so that's kind of just to give you an overview of the scale. This is pre-COVID, so this is what their typical annual sales would have looked like uh, before the COVID pandemic. And then, of course, very important uh, in seafood is the primary marketing channel. So some of the talks later today, we'll talk a little bit about farmers markets. And so we did ask respondents about their primary marketing channels. Um, you can see that 18% of them did sell direct to consumer before the COVID pandemic started. Um, and then the, a large portion of them sold to distributors uh, with processors and then also some direct sales to restaurants. Uh, other was an interesting category here too. There were some unique things there that I, I can't get into without disclosing uh, too much information. So we're, we're just gonna leave it at other. And where were these farm located? So again, this survey was confidential. We didn't record uh, exact locations of respondents. Uh, we did ask them to identify the region, the USDA defined aquaculture region that they belong to. And so this shows you where the respondents came from uh, and, and which region they belong. And uh, also compares it to what was on the USDA census so that we could look at whether we had somewhat of a, 
a representative sample. You can see that the, the Northeast region was a little bit more uh, represented in our, our, our numbers than, uh, than on the census and a little bit less in the Southern region, which is the largest region uh, for uh, US aquaculture. So, uh, but the others track fairly closely, the Western region and the North Central and the tropical, subtropical track fairly closely with what was on the census as well. So uh, I wanna talk about some of the major impacts and effects, and I'm really gonna focus on three things. Uh, those three are the lost sales, which was the, the primary issue, um, then labor challenges and production challenges, just a little bit of discussion on that too. So I do wanna say that, you know, one of the things with seafood in the United States is that a lot of it is purchased outside of the home. Uh, so in, in restaurants, a lot of the spending happens in restaurants or food service establishments. Um, so obviously when these sectors were affected and shut down because they were non-essential, uh, that meant that people couldn't go out to restaurants to eat seafood. So that very clearly uh, had an impact on the aquaculture industry. And that's what we'll talk about with lost sales. So all of the charts that you're about to see are, are laid out in this format. So the first column is all segments of respondents. And then I disaggregated some of the others just in case that someone had some interest in those. I'm not gonna discuss those in any detail, but I have them in the presentation just in case someone has a particular interest on one sector to know how that was affected. You can see that here. Um, when we asked respondents to look at lost sales and canceled contracts for quarter one, we saw that 84% had reported lost domestic sales. Um, and 80% of them had uh, private contracts that had been canceled in quarter one due to COVID-19. Uh, we didn't have many respondents that had government contracts, uh, but even with those that did, 9% said that they had uh, 9% uh, of all respondents said that they had a government contract canceled. Um, and 25% of respondents also had lost sales to export markets. Now, again, that's just across all of the respondent categories. As you see on the table, that did vary by different sector. Um, but in the interest of time, I won't dig into all of that. So of course, important is not just that you had lost sales, but also what value were those sales. So we asked respondents to kind of categorize in terms of these brackets, what, uh, what value of lost sales they had experienced in quarter one. As you can see, there was a little bit of non-response and there was also about 20% of respondents that said that they couldn't estimate the value of lost sales at that time when they completed the survey. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the biggest category categories were actually the uh, $10,000 to $25,000 range and the $25,000 to $50,000 range at 13% uh, each, followed by the $100,000 to $250,000 range of lost sales for quarter one. And again, variability here across the different sectors, having to do primarily with the size of each of those sectors and the scale at which they operate. Catfish obviously is the largest sector of U.S. aquaculture, followed by trout. So you can see there that uh, you know the the, um, the the lost sales values tended to be towards the higher end, as opposed to some of the other sectors that are somewhat smaller that maybe had some of the more uh, medium or lower end lost sales. So we had asked people about the lost sales and the value of those lost sales. And so we did a quick analysis to look at the total lost sales as a percent of annual sales that they had reported previously. Um, as you can see here, the segments of aquaculture, the, the one most affected was um, tilapia at 38%. So tilapia respondents had reported that they had lost 38% uh, of their typical sales. Um, and that was followed then by crustaceans at 29%. Um, so, so interesting to see how it breaks out differently across the different sectors. Also interesting to note here, trout sold for food fish experienced a larger lost sales uh, percentage than uh, trout sold for recreational fishing. So uh, stocking ponds, for example, or lakes. And you can see that the uh, recreational fishing for trout actually matches the uh, the sport fish game fish at 13%. So, so that was uh, 
that was interesting to know from the data. So, so another question we asked folks on the survey was how long they could survive uh, with, uh, with experiencing uh, lost sales before it became a cash flow problem for their farm. Cash flow is obviously very important in aquaculture. Um, and if you don't have any revenue coming in because you can't sell a product, then uh, you don't have any cash coming into the business. So across all segments, uh, we did have, again, some non-response. About 14% of respondents didn't answer this question. Uh, but you could see that what, uh, most of the 43% uh, of the respondents said that between one and three months. So they could go for a period of one to three months without any sales before they started to experience long-term cash flow effects that, that would negatively affect their business. Now, I do want to emphasize again that this survey was the quarter one survey, which covered the period of January through March of 2020. So we are well, well beyond that one to three month period um, from the close of quarter one survey. So just keep that in mind. Um, in terms of what this might mean in terms of future implications for, for um, cash flow on farms. So quickly about labor then. Um, we asked people about the effects on labor. As you can see, 33% of our respondents had laid off employees, had uh, terminated employees in quarter one. Um, and 40% had not yet done so, had not yet laid off any employees in quarter one and 26% indicated that they would have to soon make a decision whether or not to lay off any employees or terminate anyone. And so when we asked about the number of employees, again, we worked with ranges. Um, across all segments of respondents, we saw that the majority, 56%, had laid off between one to three employees uh, in quarter one. And that was followed by four to six employees, 19%. Uh, again, that did vary by sector. If you look across the table, you'll see that some of the uh, other segments of aquaculture, uh, those percentages worked out differently. Um, but uh, there were some instances where uh, businesses, very large businesses, had laid off over 20 employees. In one case, there was actually over uh, 100 employees that had been terminated uh, in one instance. So we asked folks that responded to this and had said that they would soon have to lay off employees, soon have to make a decision how long that would be, uh, how long before they had to make that decision. And so you can see here that, again, the majority of across all segments of, of respondents said that it would be between one and three weeks. So between one and three weeks, they would have to make a decision on laying off or terminating additional employees. And again, just as a reminder, this is quarter one. So um, this was quite a while ago in terms of when one to three weeks would have elapsed. So the last thing I wanna talk about quickly is the production challenges. We, these of course varied by sector of aquaculture. Um, you know, across all segments, when we just grouped everybody together in aggregate, we had 43% of respondents tell us that they were having problems with production inputs. So getting uh, feed, uh, chemicals, any supplies that they needed to run the farm. Uh, we had 32% tell us that they were having challenges with services. So repair, uh, construction services, consultants, engineers, uh, things of that nature, that they were having issues with, with obtaining those, which again, if those were non-essential businesses, they were closed. 29% um, of respondents had challenges with financial services, that they were not able to access those. Um, and other was a variety of, of different complex things. So we ended up just grouping it as other. And then we did have some respondents that uh, could not identify at the time of quarter one any specific challenges that they were experiencing and, and group those into any of these categories. Um, I will say that, you know, this, this also suggests that there will be longer term effects for U.S. aquaculture. Obviously, if production is being affected in quarter one, uh, if you think about the time of year and the seasonality of aquaculture products, right, quarter one is just before things start to ramp up in the spring, um, when sales usually pick up for most segments of U.S. aquaculture in quarter two, 
Um, and so, you know, people that are affected early on, um, those effects linger on throughout the business. And so I suspect that we'll see the quarter two results show that as well as uh, maybe even further out. So just some quick conclusions before I'm willing to take any questions if we have time for that. Um, obviously, because of the varied nature of US aquaculture, it is a very diverse industry. There were a variety of very specific challenges uh, impacting uh, the industry as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but broadly summarized, you know, we, we grouped those into these three topics that I talked about. Um, the disruption of traditional marketing channels uh, resulting in lost revenue from lost sales, the effects on labor and challenges with inputs, goods and services that are primarily provided by the other sectors of the US economy that were also affected. Um, I did want to point out that 13% of quarter one survey respondents had indicated that their farm or business would not survive for three months without any kind of external intervention. And when we asked if that period were prolonged to six months, we had 32% of respondents say that they would not survive um, without any external intervention. Um, and I think, like I said just previously, you know, the findings of the quarter one survey confirmed that we do need to carry forward with this assessment uh, for the duration of 2020 so that we can track the, the effects quarterly and how, uh, how the industry is responding. And also that the results really suggest that there will be longer term economic effects for the industry, even for those that do survive um, because of the, the challenges that were presented um, now during the uh, pandemic. If anyone would like any additional information, there are a bunch of a series of fact sheets that are on our website that you can access and they go into those disaggregated reports that you saw for each of those different sectors. There's also an editorial that we published and there is a journal manuscript that has been submitted that hopefully will be published soon. All of them covering the quarter one results um, and all of them will be open access available to you. Um, and with that, if there is any time, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. And if not, I'll stick around and uh, maybe I can answer some questions in the chat Jonathan, box. Jonathan, and on your survey, uh, dealing with trout, have you looked at how state regulations has impacted the sales of trout, uh, uh, you know, moving around, uh, inspection, uh, stocking? Because Sorry, David, I, I didn't hear the end of your question. I, I heard the early part about whether regulations have affected the sales. Trout guys who are trying to stock fish and move fish around. The, the, the surveys didn't ask specifically about regulations. They did dig into asking what types of measures would be helpful. Um, so, and amongst those options were things like, uh, delaying certain fees or state uh, state actions uh, that some producers or respondents did indicate. Uh, but we didn't ask specifically about regulations in this survey. It was really just trying to assess the farm mm -hmm. level impacts of, uh, of the pandemic. Yeah, because I was wondering where that, if that was a significant impact on them trying to get sales to. Yeah, I mean, obviously they, there are regulatory requirements to, you know for the different marketing channels and so switching a marketing channel is not something that can very easily be done sometimes um, without having to jump through some of those hoops and go through that process. Uh, a quarter two survey actually does ask a little bit about that in terms of whether producers have tried to change their marketing channels and whether they had any challenges doing that but like I said we're in the process of summarizing those results right now and they they'll probably be out next week. Okay. Uh, Teresa, I think you can go next. All right. Thank you so much. Um, those were so, that was sobering news, Jonathan. Um, but one thing is, is that potentially since uh, some of the farms could be out of business in three months, what I'm going to talk about today may be something that they could do that is low cost, um, no cost actually, except their time. Um, and, uh, and, and so they'd also be able to maybe implement this idea 
and boost their sales this week if they even wanted to. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, um, and start this talk. It's on um, using Google Forms, which is free, um, to take online orders. And if, I hope um, there are some agents on the line here. I hope maybe you could share this information with some of your um, farms that are, are struggling uh, today and give them some hope. Um, the question first is, okay, Google Forms for taking online orders, but uh, is it for a particular person? Well, um, it could be. Uh, what it does is that uh, you, you can't take online payments with Google Forms, uh, but you can take pre-orders. You will need Gmail, a Gmail address, um, but the good thing is that it's free. And it's also very easy to do. I mean, if you can type, you could do this. Um, it's also a new sales growth opportunity. Uh, the ability to take the online orders could uh, set you up for um, more sales. And, and what we've noticed uh, through the uh, various farmers markets is that farmers markets ha uh, uh, vendors have actually boosted their sales during COVID uh, three up to three times as uh, high uh, than last year before COVID because they started taking online orders and it didn't necessarily have to be a subscription service they paid for. They, uh, they may have used just Google, um, Google Forms to take online orders or even using the phone uh, to take orders. So doing this uh, concept is is actually worth a try uh, is, especially if you're you know you're struggling right now for ideas so what we'll learn today is that one i will review an example form what that will look like once you make one and post it either um you know post it online and then i'll show you the steps in creating a google form and then i'll show you how you can actually um, access your customer orders in real time. So as soon as they hit submit, you can go to your um, self-created spreadsheet and in real time, it'll show you what they ordered. So you can always keep track of your inventory. Okay, step one, review example form. Um, what you'll do to start is you'll do a Google search and you'll uh, type in, uh, you'll look at examples of how other farms set it up. So I just, type in farm or a Google form. Okay, and here's one that came up, the closest to an, a, a, a fish was live, like a livestock one. So they actually put it on their web page um, here. And uh, it is an order form where you just uh, have people fill in the blanks and uh, go on. And you can even put in pictures of the product and then um, they can choose how, what they want. Uh, and so on and you can go do all your products uh, basically they can choose how much you have based on your inventory uh, it can go on and on um, on and on and they even have stuff for like coffee and other things you know um, and then um, basically the person who's filling it out hit submit and then it says we received your order and thank you so it instantly goes into uh, a spreadsheet that that order has taken place and you can call them or whatever. I think actually you should have a more personalized, um, after someone submits something more personalized and we received your order somehow, uh, more caring would be, um, uh, more, more caring of a type of statement would be good. And I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about that when we make one. Um, so step two, now we're on to the next step. See how easy? Um, creating your Google form. So I just, uh, just uh, you can go to Google and then type in Google Forms and then um, it'll come here and just click on Google Forms and you will create uh, your, your Google form. I, I, I selected personal because that one's free. The business is cost will cost something. So we always want to do things for free when money is tight. So go to Google Forms, but in this case, you have to have a Google account because if you don't have one, um, just click on create an account and, and make one. 
And then um, after you do, then you'll be taken to Google Forms and then you start typing in uh, here, type in form title. Um, and that's what it'll look like. And so I typed in, you know, um, the title. And then I put in more details there um, to kind of express to the customer uh, more of what they're getting into, such as um, please comp uh, complete your form. Pre-orders will take at least 24 hours to process. So you're giving your customer a warning that, hey, this is an instantaneous, I'm a human being. Um, so, and then you'll get uh, to choose, you'll tell them, choose your pickup date and time, uh, set your pickup time at a certain, any kinds of things you wanna tell them, write it in this little section here. Um, and then also say that you don't collect the payments online because um, it's not secure. Google Forms isn't secure, but you definitely can collect enough information to do a pre-order and everything. So, uh, and then you can take their money at the time um, or even call them if they leave their number uh, to do the credit uh, card transaction via phone if they so wish, if they wanted to do that. Okay. So then, um, oh, the next thing is, so you did that first section. And then if you wanna put any pictures, like um, Dr. Neary had that really pretty picture of the farmer's market uh, set up. I would, I would like something like that if I was doing sales. So, um, but anyway, I'll just do a fake one. So browse um, here. So you click insert and link, go back here, page. See right um, there, I, I circled, just follow the little red circles that I have. Um, you click on that little icon on your form after you typed in your information, and then it'll take you to insert image, and then you hit browse, and then I just picked one um, from my little files and um, clicked open, and then it instantly puts it up there on my little form. My form is starting to take um, shape. And then um, uh, on that circle, I, I clicked on that, and then um, I started to add my questions. Uh, the first question, um, you just click on that little drop down box, and um, I'll see what kind of question I'd like to make. Um, um, the first one I actually picked was um, name. So that was a fill in, a fill -in one like a short answer. The next one was going to be like a multiple choice. So you just basically pick the types of questions you want and you add them and type in. Um, see, so there's short answer. There's one that's multiple choice. And I added in the pickup location, another short answer for phone number, um, for a paragraph, um, if, if, if you have like uh, details or you want more details and then Basically, oh, uh, basically then I wanted to click on to see it. Um, and that's what it looks like so far. And so I kept on adding different questions. I, you know, add a multiple choice question on products. Yours could be about whatever products you have. I'm taking a look at it again. It's looking um, good. You could just keep adding the questions, but you want to try to make your form uh, as simple that they could make a, a an order, uh, complete an order, you know, in uh, less than five minutes. Because uh, partly, sometimes ordering is an impulse, and so you want it to happen quick, so they're not thinking so much as uh, like ordering and then they're done. Um, so just try to make that transaction as quick. So when they hit the submit button, it right now says your response has been recorded. And I said earlier that it should be more, um, more personal. So then I just went ahead and, um, okay. And remember, just follow my little red circles. Uh, I wanted to add, add here, um, show, show link to submit another response, the confirmation message. I wanted to type in something different. Uh, and everything. So I typed in uh, this, your order has been received, we'll prepare your order. When you arrive, please park in the curbside pickup. Thank you so much, we'll see you soon. That's very personal. I click save. Um, and then so now I'm gonna test that button and, 
and it says that now, and that's much more personal. Okay, so we created a form, and that was quick, and, and you can go to this. I'm trying to be quick because we have Abigail coming soon, uh, and I want to make sure we have time, so uh, you can always look at this again and I, um, uh, later and take your time. So step three, accessing the order forms. Uh, now you're in your um, you're you're in your program still, and I pretended and made some responses there. So uh, I circled there, and then I clicked on um, the responses, and then I had to. So I I then go to um, the little green cross there and click create spreadsheet, and so create new spreadsheet. And then I typed in the, uh, the title I want to give it. And then there it is. My little fake orders are already in there and time stamped when they were. So, um, so, so then you have this and you can even set it up on your phone so you could always look at it if you so wished. Um, so basically, all a person does is they, after they, they do it, then, then they you'll have it working. So what you want to do uh, too is to get a link for, for this, um, this form. And so you click send back in your, um, back in your uh, uh, framework of your Google Forms, send, and then you get a link. So it, when you want to send people to the link to order from you, uh, you can post it on your Facebook. Um, you could send it in an email to your customers uh, and let them know that you set this up. So I click on link here and it'll give me a link. And then I click, it's such a long link, you know, for a Twitter or anything like that, social media. Uh, so I click on shorten URL and then I get a little short one and then you hit, um, click on and press Control C to copy, and you get that short one. And um, as far as like embedding it into your um, embedding the form into your web page, if you wanted to do that, then you could just embed that um, code right there. So you would just click on the two little little pointing pointer things. I don't know what that's called, sorry. And then hit copy and just put that into your, um, into your embedded into your social media or your web pages and so on. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that my little link works that, that I just created. So I click on there and I put it in there to test it. And there it is. So it's working and you can now, you know, send out your order form to all your customers that you've missed if, and you need their, and you can even tell them, you know, this is desperate times. And I was wondering if you'd like to do a pre-order and we've considered this. And, and so you could hopefully boost your income immediately. Um, and if you, if you need more help, of course I'm here, I can help um, on it. So, but I also made this little editable, editable template, what I made, and you could just write over, my, write over and change your, um, change the text, uh, add different pictures, uh, and go ahead and use my little template to get started today. And, um, you just, if you were to do that, you'd take my link that I had there and then you'd make a copy for you to use and you'd sign into your Google Forms, that um, your Google account that you had made or you have and you just, uh, it's now a copy and you just rewrite over everything basically. So in summary, uh, you do need a Google email account to use Google Forms. Uh, it's important to keep your order form very simple um, and um, for your customer's sake and for yours. And then um, feel free to modify the example template uh, any way you see fit. And um, if you need any help, um, then of course I'd be happy to help you. So there's my email there, um, tnartea at bsu.edu. And I just 
uh, wanted to encourage you that every accomplishment starts with the decision to try. So this is something at a time that's different and you could try it. And I hope and pray that it'll help you. Thank you. Are there any questions? If not, you could always email me and I could walk you through it or whatever. Teresa, thank you for that sure, presentation. Of course. If there's no questions, Abigail, I think you're up next. Okay, uh, I was muted. Uh, I just want to make sure that you can see my screen. It says Zoom. Let me set it up. Can you see my screen? Oops. <laughs> can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you all, and thank you, David, uh, for the invitation to speak to you about selling your cat at the farmer's market. My name is Abigail Villalba. I am a food extension specialist with uh, Virginia Tech. I work here in Hampton, and I am, like I said, a food safety specialist. Hence, my presentation will concentrate not only on discussing regulations, but also talking about those food safety practices that they must be, that vendors must put into place when offering seafood for sale at the farmer's market. Before I move into my presentation, I need to let you know that there has been a huge increase in farmer's market during the past several years. We used to have like 80 in uh, eight years ago. Now we have about 240 farmers market in Virginia and maybe more that sells a variety of uh, foods, including fresh fruits uh, and vegetables, meats and seafood, cheese, and many more. Remember that farmers market do help sustain Virginia working farms by keeping the food dollars in the local community and help farmers market farmers stay in business. Hang on just a second. So my today's presentation, my objectives is to briefly talk a little bit about the seafood industry, give you a few highlights. Then we're gonna move into the application process for selling seafood. Yes, there's an application process. You need to be inspected. You need to be inspected to be able to apply for it. Uh, and, and in addition to that, you need to follow some food safety practices while you're selling your foods at the farmer's market. Is that there? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Jonathan is helping me out with the uh, remote control that I have here. Um, talking about Virginia uh, highlights here, seafood industry highlights, let me tell you that Virginia is the largest seafood producer on the Atlantic coast, is the third largest in the nation. Uh, we have a total landings that reach uh, over 384 million pounds with a value to the waterman of $183 million. Our main ports are located in the, in the Reedville area. See the flag, uh, the arrow over there, as well as in the Hampton Roads area, which is right around my corner over here. So indeed, we have our seafood industry, it's an important industry in the state of Virginia. So, as I mentioned before, 
Selling at farmer's market provides another opportunity to sell uh, these seafood products directly to the consumer. Get a good price for it, provides customers with fresh and local seafood, and in return, customers uh, support the local industry. They join in that buying local movement. This is a win-win situation when selling at farmer's market. In addition to farmer's market, there are other types of direct markets, such as what you see in here, community-supported agriculture. So for seafood, those are the top two, farmer's market and community-supported agriculture are usually the best direct markets that you can use for the sale of seafood directly to the consumer. We do not have too many communities uh, CSA, selling seafood, but they're beginning to grow. About five years ago, we tried to look for those uh, CSAs that were selling seafood and it was hard to find them. But I know now there are more of those markets here in Virginia. There are more of those in the state of North Carolina too. So in addition to those two, we also have roadside markets, on-farm stores, you pick operations and as I as that Teresa was talking about online and internet access and mail orders have increased at these um, uh, uh, farmers market because of what is happening with the coronavirus. So because of that the mail order have increased and now farmers markets do have resources available in there to show you how to uh, do online sale of your product. Just like what Teresa was doing with Google Forms, some of these farmers market are awesome at providing resources for uh, vendors to take advantage of and sell their products. Now I want you to realize that most of these foods that we sell, that you see out here in this picture, fall under uh, regulation, a state regulation, and must be inspected. And even though if you're already selling at the farmer's market, you can switch it into an online. If you're new at the farmer's market and you want to sell products at your farmer's market, it is a process that you need to follow. So if you are interested in selling your seafood at the farmer's market, there are a few things that you need to know to get you organized and prepared uh, for doing that. The first thing that you need to do is you need to decide what seafood products you want to sell at the farmer's market. You can sell many kinds of different uh, items. You can sell whole or dressed fish and fillets. You can sell scalloped meats, you can sell live oysters, clams, and mussels. You can sell cooked products. You can prepackage your product and sell it and take it to and sell it to the farmer's market. It is important that you decide what you want to sell and how you want to sell it because when you are applying for the uh, inspection of these products, all that information needs to be it needs to be included in the form that you're gonna apply for. So you need to have all this uh, idea whether your product is gonna be raw, is gonna be cooked, if it's gonna be cooked, where are you gonna do it? Are you gonna do it in your kitchen? Are you gonna take it to a commercial kitchen and you're gonna prepare it over there? You're gonna prepackage it or you're just gonna put it in bulk and sell it at the, uh, at the, at the farmer's market. All of that information you need to know before you can actually move on to the next step in here. So the next thing that we um, ask you to do is to familiarize yourself with the state regulation. Most seafood will fall under the state regulations and must be inspected. You're required to apply and obtain a license from the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And this will take, you know, it's about 20 some pages. So this takes time. So it's good to have, you know, you prepare, have an idea what you're gonna sell. And now you're gonna go into the application process. 
Again, there's two types of licenses. Like I said before, decide where you're gonna sell your product at the home kitchen. You're gonna prepare it out there. You're gonna use a commercial kitchen. Based on the type of training that, uh, excuse me, based on the type of product that you're gonna be selling, you may be required to uh, take additional training. So the picture that you have in here is an actual picture of a waterman that is selling, uh, used to sell at the farmer's market. He is uh, doing it at his home. And I think what he did is he took his, uh, the side, you know, one part of the house, the outside, you can use the garage or anything like that, but he retrofitted it so it could be uh, used as a home kitchen for him to prepare the fish what he's doing right now. He's using, you need to know that you're gonna be using uh, equipment and tools that are cleanable. Uh, there is a plastic bucket in there, stainless, stainless steel, uh, uh, tables in there, and all that information needs to be added to your application, okay? So the next thing that you need to do is to select a farmer's market. So how do you do that? How do you select a farmer's market? So it's just as easy as Googling uh, Virginia farmer's market and you get, you know, for the most part, you guess those, you're gonna get those three uh, websites that I have here on my screen. Uh, you will see that the Virginia Department of Agriculture has information about, uh, information about farmer's market. You have another association. I looked at this Virginia Farmer's Market Association in here and I thought it has uh, a lot of resources over here, over here if you decide to uh, join in and become a vendor at a farmer's market. Let me see if I can click on one of those. Let me see in here. I'm clicking on, can you see my, can you see the Virginia Department of Agriculture? No, I think you need to drag it to the other screen, Abigail. Let me see how can I drag that. I'm trying to drag it. Okay, there it is. Uh, okay, I'm trying to drag it. Hang on just a second. Sun drag is going the wrong way. Okay, it is okay, not a problem. I don't want to take too much time in here. So when you click on this Virginia Department of Agricultural and Consumer Services, these are very in good user-friendly interactive sites. Once you click in one of these, uh, the website is going to give you on, um, it's going to give you a list of a farmer's market. I mean, you can click on farmer's market, CSA, you can click in there, it's going to bring you another window, it's going to give you a list of regions, you can click on the region that you like to sell your, uh, your products, and once you click in there, you're going to see a list of farmer's market, you can click in there, and that uh, farmer's market it can give you all the information that you need to know about that farmer's market. It's going to give you the name, address, it's going to show you an interactive map of Virginia. You can click on the name of the uh, farmer's market and it gives you all the information that you need to, uh, that you need to, um, you need to have in order to contact that farmer's market. Now, make sure that when you contact that farmer's market, you are prepared to ask questions about the application process. What are their food safety guidelines? If there's any handouts available for you to read, what are the temperature requirements? Anything that you need to know 
uh, in order to take your product uh, and sell it uh, to that farmer's market. You need to know if there are water access, is, if there are restrooms, where you park your car, all that information uh, will be available to you out there uh, as you click on the farmer's market. Um, one thing that we I need to tell you is due to COVID or the coronavirus, farmer's market have adopted uh, safety guidelines to keep customers safe. So in addition to having these walkthrough markets to buy your products, farmer markets are offering online ordering, drive-through, curbside pickup, and to-go order. So this is, a lot of them are selling their products that way. So it will help you to start getting familiar with what Teresa was showing you, how to put your products out there in Google Forms or some sort of uh, online application that you can sell your products. They are available out there. Now, so now you know, you know what you're gonna be selling. You have been inspected by VDAX and you have selected the farmer's market that you are going to be selling your products. You have talked to them, you have filled out their application. Now let's talk about those food safety rules for vendors that you must follow when you are transporting, displaying seafood at the farmer's market. You know, you cannot get away without these food safety practices, I'm sorry to tell you. So in order for you to sell your product to, to be safe, to be of good quality, and to keep your, custom, your customers uh, safe and coming back, you need to apply some general food safety practices in here. Very simple, you need to keep your uh, foods cold uh, and the temperature in there will be, of course, 41 or below. If you are bringing in products and there are all you can use, coolers, ice, gel packs, whatever you need to keep those products uh, cold. If you're selling hot foods and you want to bring them hot, you need to make sure that those products are being brought in at least at a temperature of 135 degrees. If you are going to cook at the farmer's market, now that's another question that you need to ask the farmer's market if you can actually cook your product at the farmer's market. Perhaps not at this time, but after COVID, maybe you can do all of this stuff. But if you're gonna cook product at the right temperature, and then we're talking about just seafood, you need to cook that seafood at least at 145 degrees. Remember, these are all temperatures for safety. Okay, you can cook higher than that, but you've got to meet those requirements, those requirements on the temp internal temperatures that you see here. You can reheat a product that is already that was already cooked. You can reheat it. It has to be reheat to at least 100 and 165 degrees uh, internal temperature. The other thing that you need to do, of course, is keep your food and equipment cleaned and sanitized. So we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Follow personal hygiene practices. And I don't know about you, everywhere I go, since I work in this industry, my antennas are always up. I cannot take that off my system. So I'm always looking to people, how they're handling, how they're using their gloves, how they're washing their hands, that they're touching their face and then touching my food, I turn away and I go someplace else to get my product. Now, another thing that you need to realize that any food, seafood that is sold at farmer's markets need to come from an approved source. It basically means that that food has to be, has to come from an, has to be inspected. In other words, you cannot just go to your neighbors and grab uh, what he is, what he just put together and take it to the farmer's market. So this, the seafood that is sold at farmer's market needs to be coming from, inspected from VDH or VDAX, or it can be inspected from another state, but it has to be inspected. Um, as you are transporting your seafood, yes, you can use 
refrigerated trucks, you can use your private vehicle to transport that seafood to the farmer's market. But when you are doing that, there are practices that you need to keep in mind to make sure that you keep that product safe and to prevent cross-contamination. So the storage space that you are using in your vehicle needs to be clean. Any dust and debris can contaminate your chill and uh, your product during transportation. So you need to be aware of that. If you are accustomed to transporting your pets in your personal vehicle, you need to clean that, you need to clean the area in which you're going to place that uh, cooler with your product it needs to be clean, even though you already have your product in the cooler. Remember the vehicle has to be clean, then you're gonna place your coolers in there. You can use separate coolers. Uh, your, excuse me, your, your coolers need to be cleaned and sanitized. Uh, they cannot be broken. Uh, they need to be, they, the lid needs to be sealed properly. You need to use separate coolers for raw and cooked products. So if you're bringing in like say uh, cooked crab cakes, you need to put those on a separate coolers. And if you're bringing in um, whole dressed fish, raw fish, then that goes into another separate coolers. Make sure that you have adequate amount of ice Ice, ice, baby, like the song says. I have to tell you that is the key here to keeping your product safe and to extend the shelf life of that product. And that is what your customers are looking for. Is it clean? Is it safe? Is it when I take it home, is it gonna last me one day or is it gonna last me three days? That ice is what's gonna keep that product that it that, that will extend the shelf life of that product as well as keep it safe. Of course, you need to have a thermometer. This is another tool that you have to carry with you. You need to have that with you in the coolers um, and to make sure that the coolers are, are keeping the right temperature. When you are at the market, now you need to make sure that you come to the farmer's market with the equipment and the tools that you need to sell your product to the public and prevent cross contaminations. Keep in mind that people are looking at everything that you do, everything that you touch, how you handle that product. And like me, you have their antennas up all the time when you are buying uh, any kinds of food, just not seafood. So make sure that you use food grade containers. This picture is the good picture that shows that the person has containers, plastic containers, plenty of ice, uh, everything is covered so it prevents uh, the seafood from getting dust or flies or wandering uh, fingers from customers, kids. Uh, dogs smelling your food, etc. So this is a good display of what you should have out there at the market. Uh, use food grade bags if you're going to be uh, selling your product. Uh, if you uh, if you're selling, please don't use any grocery bags or trash bags. They're not food grade bags, and they should not be used to store or to use when you're selling your uh, seafood or any food for that matter at the farmer's market. Make sure that you have plenty of ice, coolers with ice. Remember, you keep your uh, opening and closing that coolers throughout the day. And right now, as you know, we're, ho we're ha having this heat wave that even I, Tropical Abigail, can't even handle. So you can imagine one hour of your product sitting out there at these high temperatures. So make sure that you keep your product on ice at all times. If you cannot keep it in the cooler, make sure that you display it within a bed of ice. If you're going to be weighing product, you need to have a certified scale 
signs letting the public know what you're selling, you know, price, uh, a little bit about you, who are you, where you're located, all that information customers want to know. You want them coming back for more, anything that, any kind of information that you can provide them about your operation, about your farm, where you harvest this food, uh, the seafood is, is good. They will appreciate that. This is another picture in here when you're selling your uh, of, of a display and selling uh, for the farmer's market. So again, keep in mind that during the display, you're gonna have uh, everything is heavily iced, cover, you have tongues in there. So you're not really handling the food by hand. Now in Virginia, there is a regulation that you cannot handle cooked product with your bare hands. Okay, keep that in mind. So they want you to handle, use gloves, use tongues, use a tissue paper or something to put a barrier between your bare hands and that cooked product. Um, so again, you see the domes in here being used to protect the foods from uh, the elements. Uh, let me see if I have another picture in here. There's another picture that shows a lot of different kinds of products. And here you can see that there is cooked product. You can see cooked crab claws, you can see cooked crabs. And on the other side, you're gonna see, you see also some uh, raw fish in there. At the bottom of the picture, you're gonna see some bags of oysters in there. So in order to, this is important that when we display this product, we do it in a manner to prevent cross-contamination and a new term that is called cross-contact, and let me explain that. So to prevent cross-contamination, this picture shows you that you're keeping the raw fish completely separated from the cooked product. And everything is completely separated from the oysters. So the oysters are on one side, the, the cooked product is on, on another side, and actually the, the raw fish are in a completely separate container in there. So this is important for you to prevent cross-contamination from raw to uh, cooked product. It's the same thing that you see at the grocery store when you go to the seafood counter. You know, like me, I don't know if you're like me, I go over there and try to make sure that when they're handling my cooked product, if I buy a cooked seafood, they don't, you know, they are careful not to go from one, handling one raw, to a cook without changing, you know, changing gloves or making sure that they use tongues or some sort of barrier between their uh, bare hands. Um, so since oysters in the shell are considered a raw ready to eat products and to prevent cross contamination, we need to keep them away and completely separated from everything else. So they are here in the corner, completely separated from everything else, even though they're raw, they're ready to eat. So I cannot cross-contaminate that product with, for example, this other cooked product over here that I have, which is crab, uh, that I have crab legs and, and whole crabs already cooked. So this is the tricky part on here, and these are things that the inspectors are gonna be looking at when you display your product at the farmer's market to make sure that when you display it, there's no issue or cross-contamination or cross-contact. Cross-contact relates to making sure that I don't uh, have fish and shellfish touching each other. And that deals with uh, allergens. You know, we have eight major allergens and shellfish, crustacean shellfish and fish are two major allergens meaning that somebody can be allergic to shellfish and not to fish. So when we display the products, we need to make sure that they're not touching each other. By the way, I am allergic to shell, uh, shellfish. That happens when you start getting old. So when I go to places like this and I need to uh, buy foods, I need to make sure to ask them 
that if there's any, you know, I, first of all, I look at the display and then I look at them and I, you know, I look at them and then I ask whether or not there is any shellfish in there that can be an issue for me. Okay. Now, one thing that you need to realize that if you want to sell prepackaged products, and some people like to do that, for example, they like to prepare, uh, let's say, uh, smoked seafood or crab cakes or soups and things like that, and they want to prepackage the product at home or at their commercial kitchen, realize that when you do this, then you're required to put a label in there. And the label will require information such as the name of the product, your net weight, and the name and address of the processor. If this is a product that has more than one ingredients, you're gonna to have to put in there. The label has, has to include the ingredients in there. So if, for example, if you're making crab cakes where you have crackers, mayo, eggs, etc., all that information needs to be uh, added to the ingredients uh, label. If you're selling more, if you're selling one ingredient and it's prepackaged, you still need to provide name of the product, net weight, and name and address of the processor. Now, I just giving you bits and pieces of this information. All of this is part of the uh, VDAX application that you can find. Uh, you can click on that web link that I gave you, and all these details will be explained, fully explained in there. Uh, can I cook and serve seafood at the farmer's market? It depends on the farmer's market rules. Again, some of them, that's why you need to talk to the farmer's market. You need to make a phone call. You need to visit with them. You can go and talk to them over the phone and ask them what things you can and cannot do. Uh, if you're gonna cook again, I already give you those temperatures. These are temperatures in here based on safety of the product. You can cook a product to uh, above 145, but for safety, it needs to be cooked at least at that 145 degrees. Again, because of coronavirus, I doubt it that they are letting you uh, cook. Uh, they, and the reason for that is because they want you in and out. They don't want you hanging around a lot. Uh, they, you know, you can still walk through through these uh, farmers market, but they are some of them are only online drive through pick up go orders only. Uh, some of the farmers market have a uh, one way you can only drive this way and come out this way. They have been giving a uh, they're following the, um, of course, the uh, governor's order. You cannot gather at the seafood market. I mean, you can have people at the seafood market. You can still have to follow social distancing, you wear your face mask. You cannot touch the product. You can point and the vendor will weigh it and will sell it to you. Can I provide samples? Well, that depends on the farmer's market rules. We know that when you taste a product, you know that by selling that, by tasting that product that you're going to be selling, you can increase your, your chances of selling your product when you allow people to test your, uh, your product. So yeah, you can bring samples to it, but I don't know if you notice what we have in here in these pictures. I don't know if you can tell me, anybody can tell me what you see in these pictures at the bottom. Can anybody tell me what you see in here? Come on, turn on your, uh, unmute yourself. Sample cups. Sample cups, anybody else? What else do you see in there in these pictures? You got disposable things with only one use. That's right. So sample cups, just like Brian said, and David add a little bit more to it. You have toothpicks. This ain't your peanut bowl at the bar, okay? Do, do you remember that 
that that brings me chills to my body every time I think about the going to the bar and seeing those uh, you know those those bowls filled with charge but everybody will just grab in with your hands so this is a, this is a big no-no at the farmers market so they have pages and pages of information uh, in order for you to display and provide samples that will not be an issue of cross-contamination or an issue of cross-contact. So yes, sample cups, toothpicks, uh, disposable spoons in order for you to provide those products to your customers. And yes, we recommend that you do this because Yes, that will increase the sale of your product when you are there at the farmer's market. Again, COVID have changed this, so providing samples is not allowed now, but you need to be aware that when all this is, is when the dust settle and we come here next year, again, you're gonna be able to provide samples at the farmer's market. With that said, that concludes my uh, presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have or wait for later. I don't know, David, uh, you tell me what. Uh, yeah, I, have a couple. I really appreciate that, but I've, I got one question or a related question to what we're doing here. Uh, we talked about keeping things hot, keeping things cool, uh, cooking and all that ice. But if you're selling product that's frozen at the farmer's market uh, and on a day like this, even in a cooler, uh, you know, ice melts pretty quick. You know, you go out there and put a bag of ice in a cooler, it's, it's melted within a couple hours. So if you're doing frozen product, what's the best way to handle that? You know, how much, how much dry ice would you want to buy to keep everything frozen? You know, things of that nature. Do you want to have a uh, a freezer hook up to a generator or what? How yeah. would you handle that? Yeah, that is that is a challenge, right? And right now, it's even it's even a harder to keep these products cold. So, if you're using ice, you need to. If you use, you know, two coolers of ice, now you may need to be bringing in four coolers of ice. If you need to keep your uh, your product frozen the only time david that i've seen frozen products is coming out of a refrigerator a freezer truck i have never seen for example i go to my farmer's market and they bring in uh, meats they're not bringing in seafood yet but they're bringing in meats and they bring it out of the um yeah. out of a freezer truck so and that truck stays closed until the, the person makes their order and then they open up and they get their products out. This is a challenge keeping temperatures on these uh, products, but realize that the best thing that we can do for extending the shelf life, keeping quality and safety is to keep everything cold. So it is a challenge, David, but everything that I've seen comes out of a freezer truck. You may be able to use dry ice and allows you to open up and close the uh, cooler and still uh, have enough dry ice in there. If you still want to set it as a frozen product. Yeah, I was wondering because I know farmers uh, are selling frozen product at some of these farmers markets were selling frozen market at these markets. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, and they weren't uh, coming out from a freezer truck or anything like that. They were basically in coolers. In coolers. Maybe they have dry ice. Yeah. Well, some, or, of, some of them did. They can sell it. They can sell it frozen. They can allow it for so out. You know, there's, we do transport seafood on, you know, frozen seafood in a refrigerated truck. So it slacks up on the way. Yeah. So that's allowed too, as long as it never reaches above 41 degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, you know, if you got a code and frozen, it's going to take a while for it to unthaw. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> okay, that was my major uh, question to ask. Uh, other than that, I think everybody done a great job. I, I wish uh, uh, this is something that every 
a fish farmer that's in the business of raising fish. Should have came and looked at today, but uh, everybody's busy. Everybody's trying to do something. But at least it's recorded, and we can get it out to everybody whenever they get a chance to want to view this information. Again, this is all great information, and everybody needs to look at it. Again, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Abigail, for doing this for us. You're welcome. You're welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me.